now listening to the Hot Take Podcast with Stephen Blake, your source for everything fantasy football. Here are your hosts, Stephen Taroni and Blake Sullivan. Welcome. This is the Hot Take Podcast. My name is Stephen Taroni, the fantasy professor, and I am here live at the Midwest Fantasy Football Expo here in Canton, Ohio. We're having a good time. There was a bunch of fantasy analysts. We got booths set up. Uh, We had a good time last night at Buffalo Wild Wings, mingling with all the common folk. But today on the Hot Take Podcast, we are going to talk some sleepers. So we got a few of the best names in the industry on to talk some sleepers. We're going to talk about one wide receiver, one running back at the end of your drafts that can really reproduce value for you. We're also going to talk about Josh Gordon. So Josh Gordon reinstated. It's great news as far as I'm concerned. I'm a big Josh Gordon fan. If you've listened to the hot take, you know that I'm ready for the resurgence of Gordon. I actually had him as a wide receiver 36 before he got reinstated. So I was kind of seeing like, look, if, if he's going to play 10 games this year, he's going to return that value. So you've got to have to temper expectations if his ADP rises too much. But otherwise, if you find yourself in the eighth round, you could do a lot worse than the number one outside target for Tom Brady in 2019. So let's get into it, folks. We're going to bring in some of uh, the top names in the business to talk some sleepers. All right, let's bring in Josh Brinkner of DLF and Fantasy Pros. What is going on, Josh? I'm doing well. Excited to be here at the Midwest Fantasy Expo on the Hot Takes Fantasy Pod. And just really excited to be here. Thanks for having me on, Steve. Oh, of course, Josh. Yeah, I mean, uh, we got to know each other a little bit here. And you're a Cleveland homer. Yes, I, I'm a huge Cleveland homer. Uh, been a Browns fan since birth. Uh, so, you know, came out of the womb uh, wearing brown and orange. So, uh, I, so I'm excited for the Browns coming up and just can't wait for the season to start. That's what's up, man. Yeah, so, you know, since you are a Cleveland homer, you are probably a good person to ask about Josh Gordon. Uh, or maybe a bad person to ask. I'm not actually <laughs> sure which one. But we're about to find out. So, obviously, Josh Gordon reinstated. We haven't talked about this on the Hot Take podcast just yet. So, Josh Gordon reinstated. And, look, I'm, I'm big on Gordon. If, if the value is right, I'm probably taking him. We just looked up the ADP on Fantasy Football Calculator according to PPR scoring. He is the wide receiver 46 going into the 10th round. Is that too rich for your blood? That's not too rich, but I I don't think in a lot of drafts that you're going to get him there. I just think that ADP's trending up from, you know, from the 18th, 19th round. I think you're looking rounds five to seven because someone's going to take a, someone's going to take a flyer. For, in rounds five to seven, I wouldn't touch him. Look, I've, as a Browns fan, I can tell you the only thing you can count on Josh Gordon for is talk radio fodder. The guy is not dependable. You can't count on him. I was under a spell last year. I took him in the fifth round of SFP8, and he, he wasn't bad, but I definitely waited for that pick. So I, once he left the Browns, I kind of saw him more through not homer glasses, and I kind of saw how he just was 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 un, he was unreliable for the Browns. Makes him unreliable for fantasy and dynasty as well. I'm trying to picture the number in my head right now. It's either a 22% target share or 25% target share. But Tom Brady has only had like a few guys in, in, uh, in the 25% market share in any game in, in the history of his career. And Josh Gordon had like three of those five games, uh, something like that last year. Because, you know, he had a couple games. Where he had 14 targets one game. He had some nice games. Uh, yeah, but he really, you know, it's, it's, it was kind of a, a learning process with Tom Brady last year. And maybe in year two, they can click. And it, it, for the right price, I'm definitely willing to buy Josh Gordon for that upside. I think that you have to still view him as a wide receiver one potential uh, that's type a, guy. That's a ceiling. That's a ceiling. Uh, but, yeah, so uh, I, I think for me, I, I'm going to say, like, you know, I would look at him in the seventh, eighth round. I would. I, I think once you get past the, the seven, I'd say eighth, ninth, tenth, he's yeah. worth the risk. But like I said, I mean, he's a hot commodity in the fantasy football world. I just don't see him blasting past the seventh round. Shoot, Shane Manila picked him in, in our league, the 
FF Statistics Charity draft that we had this morning in the sixth. Uh, and that's an expert's draft. So I know most home leagues aren't experts, but shoot, he could go earlier than that. Right. And it's especially if it's a it's a Boston, it's a New England draft, or right. it's a Cleveland draft, or because I have friends who, who still love Gordon. Right. So I just think it's if you can get him in the eighth, ninth, tenth round, go for it. If it's if if it's before that. Personally, I wouldn't do it. Right, yeah. I think the risk is too much in the fifth round because we never know with Josh Gordon. Yep. Uh, he could miss, you know, half of the season. We're just not sure right now. But, uh, you know, really that ADP is going to fly up if he still plays in one of these preseason games uh, and they see, and we actually see Josh Gordon on the field. Um, so that would be interesting to see. So let's move on, Josh. Sure. I want to get your input or your on the sleeper. So this is a sleeper episode. We're doing one wide receiver, one running back. Let's start off with your running back. Running back. And I can't believe I looked at this yesterday, and if, uh, for fan, and I looked at Fantasy Pro's ADP. Justin Jackson's ADP is thirteen point oh seven, so he's gone in the mid in the mid of the middle of the thirteenth round. To me, that is crazy. I mean, it, maybe just me. I don't think there's going to be a resolution to this um, Melvin Gordon uh, Chargers holdout anytime soon. And I what I think they offered him, the Chargers offered Gordon what ten million. He wants what fourteen, I think, something like that. I just that's a pretty. He wants Le'Veon Bell. Money. Yeah, he wants he wants Le'Veon Bell money, and I mean, does he deserve it? Probably, but I I think the Chargers are comfortable going with Jackson and Eckler. And the thing about Eckler is his ADP seven oh three. I I think Eckler is going to be your safer option of the two because no matter if Gordon's back or if Gordon stays out, Eckler's still going to be the scat back PPR option going to be a safe uh, flex play with some you know running back two upside but I think Jackson is the guy that you want especially in the 13th round on uh, weeks 12 to 14 last year with Melvin Gordon out uh, Jackson carried the ball 31 times for 133 yards two touchdowns caught six or seven targets for 69 yards so he has that PPR upside Justin Jackson does too and I would think that he's going to um, he's going to get a lot of the red zone action for example uh, if, if, if Melvin Gordon is out that leaves 37 red zone opportunities from last year, uh, 24 carries, 13 targets, and 10 touchdowns from those opportunities. So I think Justin Jackson is someone. If he's making it to, if he's making it past the 11, 12th round, you got it. You got to jump on. Him. Definitely, yeah. That's someone to keep on your radar here, Justin Jackson. Because like we were talking off there, yeah, you can get Austin Eckler in the seventh round. That's fine, but why not just wait on Justin Jackson in the 13th? Uh, it's a great point that Austin Eckler is their scat back. Right. He's going to have standalone value even if Melvin no matter what. is there. So that is the safer option. Justin Jackson, obviously, dependent on Melvin Gordon missing time. The way I'm seeing it right now, and I've said this on Hot Take before, I think Melvin Gordon's going to miss the first 10 games of the season. I think he's going to come back in week 10. Just to get us, yep. Yeah, he's going to be obligated to do that. Um, and I think that the Chargers are just kind of like they're playing that game of chicken. They're, they're going to play. Um, they want Melvin Gordon, obviously, but I think what's more important to them for Melvin Gordon is the star stature that he brings, not so much his – uh, his uh, reliability at the running back, they're okay replacing that position, but they do like him for the marketing brand that he brings because he is yep. a superstar in yeah. this league. I, I would say he's the most – I think he's the biggest superstar on their team probably. Right. at this. I mean, Keenan Allen is, but, I mean, he's the guy, you know, the high out of Wisconsin. I, it's – I really, really, yeah. I think what you're saying is right. They're not going to come to an agreement. He's gonna, he's gonna stay out till week eight, eight or ten. Is it week eight or ten? I think it's week ten. Week ten. Okay, to get his unrestricted free agent status. I think that this is going to drag on, and and there could be a point where you know, well, maybe they don't need him. Maybe Justin Jackson, you know, is doing well in Eckler. I, I just think that they feel comfortable with who they have right now going into the season. I mean, well, obviously they, like you said, they want Melvin Gordon, but I think they would live without him. Yeah, definitely, especially if it comes to having to pay him four extra million dollars a yeah. year. Um, so let's move on to your wide sure. receiver here, Josh. Uh, what do you think for wide receiver sleeper? Now I know we talked uh, we talked out off air about this, and you <laughs> and Steve wasn't uh, exactly in love with my sleeper, but I don't care. I, I own this guy, and here's what I always say about fantasy football: I won't give advice that I don't do in my own. I just won't do it. And I know I'm sure you're the same way. Yeah, no, Obviously, no. you know, we're out here. We, we want to be credible sources. I love Tyrell Williams. I do. I own him in about 90 to 95% of my leagues, either redraft or dynasty. And I just think, I think there's a lot of talent there and he's got some opportunity. For example, he, uh, his 68.8% contested catch rate last year would have been first among all NFL receivers, but it's a minimum 20 targets. So he did that on 16 targets. Uh, and, it, and when Williams gets a chance to, you know, gets, gets the targets, he can be the guy. In 2016, he saw 100-plus targets and put up 
69 receptions, 1,059 yards, seven touchdowns. I believe he's wide receiver 18 that year. Um, and there, I know Antonio Brown's going to get a lot of these, but the Raiders are losing 304 targets uh, since they lost Jared Cook, Jordy Nelson, Seth Roberts, and Marshawn Lynch. And I really do think Williams is going to see a lot of one-on-one coverage this, this year. And I mean, and that 68.8% catch rate is going to be huge. He's going to be one-on-one because they're just going to, you know, they're going to double up around a lot of the time to see who can really beat him. And I really think that Tyrell Williams is going to be, uh, I think he's a pretty safe wide receiver three option. I'm not going to lie. Yeah, I mean, when you're looking at the landscape of wide receivers, especially late rounds, you want to look at guys that are on the field. Right. Tyrell Williams is going to be on the field. Absolutely. Opposite of Antonio Brown, and you bring up a good point. I mean, A.B. has been erratic. He yep. has been anything but, uh, you know, reliable at this point in the offseason with the feet thing. Yeah. And, and the helmet gate. Yeah, the helmet gate. I mean, so at this point, if you're thinking uh, A.B. might miss some time, well, Tyrell stepped into a great situation. Absolutely. I, he does have a really good situation there. Um I just I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. I, I think that Tyrell Williams has re- never really gotten his chance except for 2016, and he finished. You know, he was a wide receiver too. So I think he could. I think he's. I think his floor is wide receiver three. He's got wide receiver two upside. If Antonio Brown goes a wall or has or has issues with his feet all year, which is, I mean, he's trying to. If you watch Hard Knocks, he's trying to grow new skin. Right. That's not some that's easy. Right. So he could have issues where maybe it's, you know, it's 1130 and week four and you find out Antonio Brown's got to sit out for the week, you know. Yeah. So he could be one of those late game and active scratches. You could throw – and Tyrell Williams could be the wide receiver one for them several weeks. You never know. I really like Tyrell Williams as a player. I just don't like his quarterback right well, now, especially, uh, you know, if you're thinking, okay, uh, Josh Jacobs is going to get targets. They want to feed Antonio Brown the ball. It's going to be funneled probably to A.B. when he's on the field. When Tyrell was a free agent, I was actually rooting for him to be uh, on the Patriots because I'm yep. a, I was assuming that Josh Gordon wouldn't play, and I'm thinking, look, if Tyrell can step into that Josh Gordon role that we saw last year, which was very favorable, yes. uh, you know, that big receiver that Tom Brady really likes. He, does, he never has big receivers. I mean, he had Randy Moss a while ago. Uh, and then you had Josh Gordon last year, but he never has that big guy who can get down the field. So I would have loved Tyrell in that situation. But with the Raiders, I'm, I'm kind of fading it. But for the ADP, you're not risking anything. Right. His ADP, uh, I have it at 1110 right now in Fantasy Pros. So, so you're talking wide receiver four. Uh, you could probably get him at a wide receiver four. And like I said, I think he's got wide receiver three floor. And it's, I, I think the Raiders, sure, they look good in the preseason. I think they're going to be behind a lot. They're going to be playing catch up. So, hey, garbage time points count the same, in my opinion. So. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're talking about wide receiver, three, wide receiver three upside, you're definitely right, Josh. I mean, Tyrell Williams, if you told me, yeah, you finished as a wide receiver 34, I would not be surprised. Oh, no, I think that's – and, I mean, and if things break right, could be wide receiver two. You never – you know, you just don't know. It's, I think you got to take some chances on guys like that that are kind of – I mean, obviously he's not the first name off everyone's lips, but I think he's he's got talent. He has experience in this league, and I think if – God knows what's going to happen with Antonio Brown, so he's, he's got some upside there as well. Josh Brickner, DLF and Fancy Pros. Where can people find you on Twitter, man? Uh, I am at Josh Brickner, at J-O-S-H-B-R-I-C-K-N-E-R on Twitter. Yeah, I, I write for Dynasty League Football. I actually wrote an article on Tyrell Williams for Fantasy Pros earlier, kind of his three uh, top destinations, and I had the Patriots on there as well. Because I that would have been – yeah. Ideal, right? I literally bought up – a lot of the Dynasty shares I bought up before free agency, yeah. hoping that he – he would all become the wide receiver one on a team. I thought maybe he would be the wide receiver one on the Raiders even before they signed him. So it was, you know, he's kind of wide receiver two, which he kind of moves up because he was always a wide receiver three in San Diego except for the one year. Exactly. So, so yeah, I think he's I think he's had a great opportunity, and I would I have no hesitation drafting him. And I think if you're looking for an upside, if you're looking for a safer guy with some upside, I think you should do it. All right, now we have Ryan Weiss from the Fantasy Footballers on the show, continuing our Sleepers episode. And we've got a bunch of awesome analysts here, so we're going to get another one of him. It's Ryan Weiss of Fantasy Footballers. What's going on, man? How are you, Steve? Glad to be here. Yeah, it's pretty exciting. We just got done a, uh, a draft for uh, FF Statistics charity. Um, who did you donate to? I stuck with St. Jude as a writer for the Fantasy Footballers. Um, One dollar of every Ultimate Draft Kit goes towards St. Jude's Children's Hospital. And so since I'm here representing the Fantasy Footballers, I, I stuck with their charity because it's a great cause. 
fantastic, man. Yeah, how did your draft go today? Um, it could have went better. No, I, I, <laughs> I picked from the two slot. It's weird. I've done um, industry drafts before, but they've always been online. So being in the same room at the same table with everybody making those picks was a very uh, interesting yeah, experience. Uh, you don't yeah, typically just... expect to get sniped in the 12th or 13th round of a draft, but it happened quite a bit. So. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> the players that you know are going to be there usually were just are not there. Absolutely. But I did see you got some Robbie Anderson. I got him as well. Love me some Robbie Anderson. I wrote an article a little while back about him possibly being a wide receiver one this season. So he's a, he's a guy I mark in every draft. Wide receiver one? I think it's a possibility. I think you're going to see him go over 1,000 yards for the first time of his career. And I think Sam Darnold looks primed to finally get him into a double-digit touchdown situation. And that's uh, about what it's going to take. So. Yeah, I mean, Robbie in his second year was close to that 1,000-yard season. He had 114 targets in that year. Of course, that was Josh McCown, who was in love with Robbie Anderson. I think Sam Darnold found the connection at the end of last year. I think that's what we saw. And Robbie still had 94 targets last year. So that's kind of where he's around is that 100 target mark. If he can get up to that like 120, that's kind of the mark I'm looking at. And then, yeah, that's definitely a possibility. Um, so let's talk about another wide receiver that you can get a little bit later in your drafts right now. Has some high upside. And I use high loosely. There. <laughs> it's Josh Gordon, of course. We've been talking about Josh Gordon today. So I want to get your thoughts on it right now on Fantasy Football Calculator. He's at the 1003, so he's moving up probably will be in the seventh round at some point. I imagine, you know, by the end of August, seventh round. Uh, where are you uh, looking to take Josh Gordon? Are you fading him? Definitely not fading him. I actually just put out an article this week of uh, five wide receivers to target at the end of the draft, and Gordon was mentioned in there. And I, I – covered the eye roll because I know when everyone sees Josh Gordon's name, the initial reaction is rolling their eyes because they don't want him on their fantasy team. But um, in 11 games last year, he went over 700 yards. He scored three touchdowns. And if you remember when he played for Cleveland, three touchdowns is a low number for Josh Gordon in seven games. Um, with Gronk gone, he's going to be the big target in that offense. I don't like the comments Belichick just recently made where he said, you know, now that we've handled the league matter, we're going to see how he fits with the team. Not exactly the uh, vote of confidence you'd like to see of a guy coming back, but I am definitely not fading. I'm all aboard at 10-3. There's no question there. And I think even if he rises to the seventh and eighth, I'm still going to take a flyer. I think he statted out to my wide receiver 31 in my most recent rankings, and that could still end up going up. So Yeah, that's a little bit higher than me. I have him at 36 right now, but that was actually before he was reinstated. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he can move up a little bit. I mean, I'm a big Josh Gordon fan, so you have to temper your expectations every time you're, like, into a player because if he gets up into that fifth, sixth round, you might want to reconsider. But that eye roll you're talking about, if – a lot of people will roll their eyes. That's probably a good time to Exactly. Buy. Keeps that value low. Exactly. So let's get into the sleepers. Uh, so we're going to do one wide receiver, one running back. So let's start with your running back, Ryan. So my running back is Deion Lewis. Um, I went ahead and was looking at the uh, running situation in Tennessee. It's no question that they want to run the football. Um, Marcus Mariota is an accurate quarterback, but he's much more accurate on short routes. I'm a little concerned with them bringing in Adam Humphreys, but even last year, while they were pounding the ball with Derrick Henry, Deion Lewis could still perform, not to his same level, but he ended the year with 155 carries, which is more than Tariq Cohen, who was the running back 13. Um, you're going to see a guy, it was more than James White had, who was the running back eight. So you have a guy who is going to get more carries than James White and Tariq Cohen, but could get as targeted in the passing game if things go his way. He needs touchdowns. That's the big thing. I mean, who doesn't? But the thing that's going to make Deion Lewis a great sleeper this year is if he start scoring touchdowns and I think it's something he can do it's a second year in that offense and that's when you're going to see a breakout I mean yeah I mean he is the pass catching running back for the Titans and then if he can get you those carries too I mean that's a safe floor yeah I don't see any situation where uh the Titans are gonna game script him out of a game he's going to be used in conjunction with Derrick Henry yes they're going to run Derrick Henry into the ground but we also know that Derrick Henry may not be able to handle that kind of volume he's had his injury issues as well um and the Titans are going to be behind a lot and that's where you're going to see Deion Lewis coming into the game quite a bit I, I think he's going in the 40s or 50s for running backs right now I have him statted out as in, in my mid 30s so yeah I mean we were just I'm just thinking about the durability right now of uh, Derrick Henry and Deion Lewis I kind of think about Alex Barnes right now I yeah don't know. <laughs> yeah I mean and that's the thing is you always have these guys who pop up out of nowhere and you could see Barnes take over for both of them if Henry goes down so it's an interesting situation but where you can get Deion Lewis which is in the double digit rounds that's a guy I'm taking a flyer on yeah, that's value. I'm looking at Chris Allen right now over here, and I know he drafted Deion Lewis earlier. He, he was running up to the draft court to do it uh, because, you know, you lose the running backs, you know, very quickly uh, in drafts, and then you kind of forget about guys. Deion Lewis provides a lot more value than you're going to get. I mean, if you're thinking, you know, oh, I, I might want to get uh, Chris Thompson, you might as well just get Deion Lewis. Um, so let's move on to the wide receiver. Who's your wide receiver, Ryan? Uh, I've been uh, tooting the horn for John Brown for just about as long as he signed in Buffalo. So I'm going with John Brown as my sleeper wide receiver. Um, 
uh, managed to get him in the, uh, the industry draft, the charity draft we just did. So I was very happy about that. Um, one of the things I'd like to say about this, and believe me, I'm not saying they're as good, but last year, Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Hill showed how a strong arm quarterback and a fast wide receiver can break the NFL. And I feel like we're going to get a light version of that in Buffalo. Um, while Allen is not the quarterback Mahomes is certainly not by an accuracy standpoint, he has a rocket for an arm and John Brown is a burner. He actually had the highest yards per catch of his career last year with just a shade over 17. Um, I also heard recently that Josh Allen was only, I think in second place in average depth of target. He likes to throw the ball deep. And I feel like that's going to be a breakout year for John Brown. Another guy like Robbie Anderson, who's a deep threat. He's going to finally see a thousand yard cross like he did back in 2015 for Arizona. And if Josh, Allen has 10 touchdowns in them they're going to go to John Brown yeah that a dot you mentioned yeah he was up there I believe he was second he was right behind Deshaun Jackson of course he got a little bit more volume so really you could say he was first over 90 targets um, and then of course it was Mike Evans and Robbie Anderson our boy Robbie there you go 15.7 but you know who was higher than all of the players I just mentioned mentioned they thought it's Robert Foster Zay that last year was 20 over 22 now of course low volume so just talk to me talk me into John Brown over Robert Foster so I had this question asked to me recently actually so Robert Foster was there they knew what they had in Robert Foster they immediately go out and get Cole Beasley and if I remember correctly I think John Brown was the first free agent wide receiver to sign so before anybody else the Bills went out and got their guy John Brown I think Robert Foster is a talent, and I think he has a chance to break through, but I think he's going to have to get past John Brown. And at this point, with John Brown now being a veteran, six years deep in the NFL, I don't see Foster being able to outplay him this year. I think Allen's going to know who he can trust, and it's going to be John Brown early. I don't, I'm not saying the Bills are going to be behind a lot, and with Tyler Croft hurt, the guy they brought in to play tight end, you're going to see a lot of four wide sets out of them with Zay Jones, Cole Beasley, uh, John Brown, and then Robert Foster. Foster's going to get his, but if I'm gambling early in the season – and you're doing it in the 11th round, I'm taking John Brown. And we saw what Brown did last year with some volume and actually playing in the full season. I mean, with Joe Flacco, he was playing really well. I mean, he was a wide receiver, too. He got over, he got 94 targets last year. So you like that in a big play wide receiver with that kind of volume. So, look, if now he has Josh Allen. You can compare, you know, Joe Flacco's arm to him as far as being a big arm, deep ball thrower. Yeah, I mean, it could be – we know that the ceiling's there for John Brown. We know the ceiling's there. Ryan, thanks for coming on, man. Where wow, can, Steve, it was yeah. great to have you. Yeah, or great better. to be on. <laughs> uh, so where can the folks find you on Twitter, man? So I'm on Twitter at the Fantasy 5 Everything is spelled out. So the Fantasy 5 And you can find my work with the Fantasy Footballers at thefantasyfootballers.com. All of the writers turning out a, churning out a ton of good content. Um, I posted three articles this week. So if you're looking for weight line wide receivers, I'm your guy. And go get Tevin Coleman as well. I just dropped that article a couple days ago. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now you're talking. I do like me some Tevin Coleman. All right, Ryan. Thanks for coming on, man. All right, let's keep it rolling here uh, for our Sleepers episode. We have Scott Connor of Dynasty Command Center and the Dynasty and Chill Pod. What's going on, Scott? How's it going, Steve? Pretty good, man. Yeah, we're here at the Midwest Fantasy Football Expo. We just did our uh, fantasy statistics charity draft. Scott was one of the most talked about guys in the draft room. And I'm talking about we had, you know, maybe 150 analysts. And Scott was one of the most talked about guys because he went eight straight running backs, one quarterback, and then seven more running backs. And this is a super flex type league with a a tight end premium. So we got to get your thoughts on your strategy here, Scott. Yeah, so I looked about the scoring for this. And first of all, before we even get to the scoring, you got to look at just the setup. You start, you can start two super flexes, but you do not have to start a quarterback. So that's the first thing. Second thing is you start 10 overall players and eight of them are flexes, two are super flex. And you don't have to start a quarterback. So there's no position requirements. You don't have to start a tight end. You don't have to start any receivers. So when I plugged in the scoring, essentially it's a tiered PPR league, but you're also getting half a point for first downs for running backs too. So when I plugged in the scoring, essentially just took some basic projections and plugged in the scoring, and the running backs were super, super heavy uh, when compared to the other positions. So, you know, the first thing I looked at is I wanted to start really running back heavy. I had planned to start three or four running backs and then see what's on the board. But truthfully, the quarterbacks came off the board a lot faster than I expected. And I don't have the board in front of me, but I think by like round five, we were on like Jameis Winston. And this is a league where you get negative four for interceptions. And someone like Winston's already getting drafted. I'm like, I'm just going to completely zag from the rest of the crowd. So It's funny. Jameis is one of those guys when there's minus four for interceptions. He's the guy that you kind of look at like, oh, 
Yeah, and I mean, it's not that I don't necessarily think that we can project Jameis to do exactly what he's done, you know, for the first four years of his career this year. But the quarterbacks just went off the board faster than I expected. And you don't have to have one. You know, you do not have to start one. So I figured I'm just going to hammer running back. And uh, it went from there where I ended up with 15 of my 16 picks for running backs. That's amazing. Yeah. So, I mean, it kind of goes to show you when you're drafting. I mean, you you might get in a situation you're like, oh, man, I have too many running backs. I need a receiver. And then you you kind of zone in or get in that tunnel vision, like, okay, receiver, receiver, receiver. You might miss the best player on the board, which could be a running back. It could be any position. So I think that's kind of what you were doing, Scott, and you kind of playing uh, to the, the, the format or the strategy of the format. And in your mind, hey, running back was, was the most valuable position to get consistently. Yeah, and I mean, the, you know, another thing I looked at is I'm probably not – I knew I was not going to draft a tight end because you don't have to start one. And it is one of the most – actually, the in, most injury-prone position. Did you, did you draft a tight end? I did not draft a tight end. And, you know, if you really just look at how you compare, like, Kittle or Kelsey with the other receivers, you know, they're maybe worth taking in the second round of this draft, but they were already coming off the board, you know, hot and heavy. And when you're getting down to outside the top, like, 10 tight ends, you know, I'm not even touching those type of players. So I started taking handcuff running backs. The – the two things I maybe regret was I waited maybe a little bit too long for quarterback. I ended up getting Tom Brady, I think, as the 25th quarterback off the board. The only thing the quarterback gives you, I think it gives you more predictable week-to-week points. Um, but after that, you know, the only other thing is I did hand – I ended up with four pairs of running backs. I ended up with the Seattle running backs. Uh, I took Pollard to back up Zeke. Uh, I ended up with both Miles Sanders and Jordan Howard. Uh, that was maybe the only thing I regret is I took too many of my own handcuffs. So does that limit my upside in a 36-man league? We'll see. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. But, you know, if one of those guys goes down, you're in a good situation, obviously. So let's move on. Let's talk about Josh Gordon real quick, and then we'll get into our sleepers. So Josh Gordon, he's at the 10 He's probably going to move up draft boards, obviously, uh, with uh, the news coming out that he is reinstated. So what are your thoughts on Josh Gordon? Are you willing to take him? Short answer, not really. I think there's a very, very – flat tier of receivers this year uh, outside of say the top 15 or 16 uh, you can get all the way down to 40 50 round range or 40 50 receiver range where it's just really really flat so I don't see the need to take the risk with someone like Gordon especially with the buzz right now we'll see where he settles out in a couple weeks Uh, I'll be in Vegas for the FFPC main events and we'll see where he goes there but I think that maybe the buzz a little bit, like he went in round six of the charity draft that we just did. And to me, that's just way too high to take that type of risk with how many good receivers there are. Yeah. I mean, if we can, you know, know that he's going to be there week one, which we still really don't know. I mean, we right. really don't know if he's going to be there week one at this point. Uh, we can project it. We can say, hey, he's the best receiver not named Julian Edelman on this team. Yeah, we know that. Uh, but we really have to see. But if, he, if he's going to be there week one and we know that, I, I'm thinking sixth, seventh round for me is like the earliest I would consider him. Um, right now, six is definitely a little too high. Uh, but look, obviously the upside is there for Josh Gordon, who's a wide receiver one type of talent um, in the league, especially on this kind of offense. So look, Josh Gordon is going to be highly talked about. And, you know, even during the season, you're going to be looking to see if he's, if he's going to be playing because he at any time, you know, could get popped. Uh, we know that he's had trouble with this in the past. Um, so for him to be reinstated at this point, I think it's it's really good news. Uh, we just have to temper our expectations and, and kind of monitor that ADP with Josh Gordon. So, Scott, talk to me about your sleepers. Let's start off with the running back. Sleeper running back. So mine is Deion Lewis. And so, oh, okay. So you're the second one to have Deion Lewis on here. Uh, Ryan uh, Weiss of Fantasy Footballers had Deion Lewis as well. Yeah, with Deion Lewis – If you just look at what he did last year, and I don't think he's going to be able to get the same amount of touches that he got last year. I think he had 210 touches last year. But, you know, obviously Derrick Henry is still out right now with the calf injury. We don't know what that's going to be. Uh, We don't know if he's going to end up missing time. He should be ready for the season, the last thing I checked. But I just think Deion Lewis is one of those guys that he's been proven in the past. He's on a run-heavy team. And he gives you a little bit of a floor in a PPR league that you don't get from a lot of other handcuffs. And it just seems right. like he's being disrespected. People are jumping on uh, like justice Hill. I took him today, but I see him moving up and up and up. Some of these draft boards, uh, Darwin Thompson, same thing. You know, you see people reaching on these guys trying to hit the home run, but if you really just look at, you know, what does their profile say? You know, I don't ever see justice Hill or Darwin Thompson leading a backfield at best. They become a 
a weapon that's used a specific way each week. But I don't ever see them being a quote unquote lead winner like people slap the Camara tag on. So essentially, you're getting a guy that no one really wants in Dion Lewis a couple rounds later. Yeah, I mean, we say it on on the hot take. I mean, look, if if there's people that if if they're players that are being faded by the consensus. Take a look at that player. If people are ro- rolling their eyes when this guy is drafted because it's like, oh, that, that's ugly. That, that's, a, that's not aesthetically pleasing to me to, to get a Dion Lewis, right, over like the, the, the Justice Hill, the flashier names, right, the, the rookies. Dion Lewis' role is solidified right now as the pass-catching pass running back uh, in, in Tennessee. It's not going to be Derrick Henry catching balls. It's going to be Dion Lewis. So you're going to get some, you know, a, a higher number in targets than you will some of these running backs that you're drafting in the double digits round. Um, you know, there's, there are multiple guys that you can look at with like, oh, okay, he has a high upside. No. Well, Dion Lewis has a nice floor um, and he's a safe play for you. Yeah, I think another one, I know you said someone else already talked about Dion Lewis. I think Chase Edmonds is another one. I mean, this is a direct handcuff to one of the best running backs in the league, but also a player that struggled with injuries in the past. And we still don't know what the Arizona offense is going to look like in, in real life. Uh, we've seen glimpses of it in the preseason, but Chase Edmonds is a guy that I own in a ton of dynasty leagues, and I'm usually taking him at the end of drafts. There's an injury. You know, that's a player that automatically will vault up into you know the low-end running back two conversation because yeah. he's a talented player. He's just been stuck behind David Johnson. And you know the Cardinals, even though they've changed regimes, they have really never done anything to bring competition in for Chase Edmonds. So that says something where a lot of these other backfields are bringing in multiple guys. That's a good point. Yeah, I just got Chase Edmonds in the 15th round of the draft that we just did. Uh, I mean, look, I think they're going to use both players. I think they're going to use a lot of David Johnson, but they're also going to use Chase Edmonds a lot in the passing game. Uh, Sometimes they like to use uh, David Johnson in the slot. They are going to use Chase Edmonds in the slot a little bit as well. Um, So if you're talking about that, like, there could be plays where David Johnson's lined up in the backfield and Chase Edmonds is in the slot, I really love that. And, you know, there are – you could do a lot worse than Chase Edmonds at the end of, uh, of even a regular uh, PPR draft Yeah. Um, in redraft. So let's move on to your wide receiver, Scott. So wide receiver, I know I said earlier there's just a ton of receivers out there when you get into – anywhere after like the ninth round of drafts, like the receivers start coming off the board all over the place. You may see a guy go in round nine in one draft, and then he goes in round 13 in another one. Uh, Michael Gallup is mine. And he's my biggest, one of my biggest buys in dynasty right now. But even for this year, if you just look at uh, the way that Dallas is being projected, obviously this is dependent on Ezekiel Elliott. I think if he doesn't come back, it's really hard to predict what their offense is going to look like. You might think, well, if he doesn't come back, that means they're going to have to pass it more. But does that mean that they're going to be better off passing more? I'm, I'm not sure about that. Less scoring opportunities right. you can project, less first downs. Right. So, I mean, for this to, to come true, I think we need a couple of things to happen. One is I think Zeke needs to come back. Uh, but also, if you just look at a lot of projections with the Dallas passing offense, it's not as low volume as a lot of people perceive it to be. Um, it's not going to be you know top 10 in the league, but anywhere from like 15th to 18th. So middle of the pack. Uh, but then if you look at the way that they spread their targets around, I'm not really sure what their tight end usage is going to look like. But outside of Amari Cooper, who's obviously dealing with some sort of foot injury, I know we've heard that it's, he's dealing with a heel injury and also a turf toe injury. You know, Michael Gallup is going to be the second in line for targets. And I think he's been underrated from the standpoint of he was supposed to be, quote, unquote, the guy last year right. because their depth chart was so bad. And – I think we put a lot on his shoulders for being a rookie and he didn't get off to a good start because of that. But near the end of the year, he was actually being uh, targeted a lot by Dak Prescott. They just weren't connecting. And I know they've made it a point to talk about how him and Prescott have worked on their rapport this year. So I think he's a guy that you can get a lot later than some of the other receivers. And he's kind of a guy that could be, it's almost like handcuffing a running back. If something were to happen to Cooper where he misses games, they could slide him into a role where he's getting you know, potentially 110 plus targets. And if Zeke comes back, I still think he'll be somebody that's relevant for fantasy compared to where you're having to pick him. I think that's a great post type sleeper because everyone was on Michael Gallup last year as a potential wide receiver one for this Dallas team. After, of course, they let Des Bryant go. Uh, it was like, who's going to be the wide receiver one? They got Michael Gallup uh, and he was projected to be that guy. Now that they have Mari Cooper, no one's really thinking about Gallup. You, you're not thinking of Cowboys offense as a highly potent passing offense. So you don't really want more than one receiver, which everyone is looking as at Amari Cooper right now. But I think a very savvy pick in fantasy football this year is Michael Gallup because 
you're going to spend a third round pick with Amari Cooper, or you can get a running back there. You can get somebody like an Aaron Jones if you believe in his talent. You can get a Devontae Freeman, who is another guy who's being definitely slept on. And then you can just wait and maybe get a better value with Michael Gallup because at the end of the day, how much more targets is, is Mari Cooper really going to get than Michael Gallup? I mean, if he plays a full 16 games, yeah, Mari Cooper is going to be the more targeted receiver by a good bit. But we're already talking about him with injury concerns. Uh, it just kind of seems like that Amari Cooper, who has always been erratic in fantasy football, will potentially continue to be. And then you might have some consistency with Michael Gallup. Yeah, and I think yeah. we also are a lot, a, a lot slower than we should be to react sometimes in fantasy. And I've heard a lot of good things about Kellen Moore, uh, the new offensive coordinator for Dallas. So maybe that offense isn't going to look exactly like what we've seen in the last couple of years. So that's another thing is maybe they do – go a little bit more up-tempo, and maybe they do use the receivers a little bit differently than they have in the past. So I like that call. He's just someone to pick up where you can. And, you know, if he doesn't hit receivers, I always say there's always receivers on the waiver wire that can score you 8 to 10 points. So the worst thing that can happen is you end up dropping him. Yeah, I mean, Michael Gallup is a dynamic receiver, and uh, he could be in a good position. You make a good points, Scott. I said it before, uh, this Cowboys offense might not be as stagnant and, you know, vanilla as it has in the past. It might be a little bit more uh, dynamic than we've seen in the past. So if that's the case, then you got to love Michael Gallup. He's in a good situation. He's a good deep ball threat. Uh, he can also work underneath. So I think Michael Gallup is a great double-digit round receiver. Scott Connor, uh, thanks for coming on the show, man. Where can everybody find you on Twitter? You can find me at Charles Chill FFB. Uh, I am one of the analysts over at Dynasty Command Center, so you can check that out as well. We have a great premium Slack chat over there, great community uh, with a, a lot of great fantasy players and a lot of great Dynasty minds as well. Um, and then you can check out my podcast, which is uh, the Dynasty and Chill podcast. So check it out on all podcast platforms. All right, continuing with our sleepers live from – the Midwest Fantasy Expo. We have Matt Williams of FF Statistics on the show. What's going on, Matt? Oh, not much. Thanks for having me on. Uh, tons of fun. It's, uh, it's a lot. Of, it's good meeting everybody, and uh, it's been great so far. Yeah, we just wrapped up the draft. Obviously, you were uh, spearheading the, uh, the FF Statistics charity draft. Uh, you did a good job organizing everything with three leagues drafting simultaneously. Yeah, it got off to a, a little bit of a rough start. 30, 36 different people trying to show up 9 a.m. after we were all out late meeting each other <laughs> last night it was uh, a little rough yeah it was a little rough but yeah we all got there we got done in time for the expo to start and uh everyone seems pretty happy with their their teams in a, in a crazy format that we had going yeah the draft board guy shows up and then we were trying to set up the draft boards and it's like how many fantasy fans or fantasy football analysts does it take to set up draft boards like but once we actually start drafting it, that was more of our element yeah yeah it ended up ended up going good and uh yeah we ended up having a contest to see who could finish first and everyone kind of sped up Right, exactly. Yeah, so I've been asking everybody about Josh Gordon. So actually in this uh, in the draft that we just did, I think the highest that Josh Gordon just went was the sixth round. Um, so right now in uh, Fantasy Football Calculator, he's at the 10.03. He's going to move up. What, do you, what are your thoughts this year on Josh Gordon? I, you know, I, since the news came out, I was over here doing so much stuff. I haven't actually gotten an opportunity to even think it out. I know I heard uh, tags on the, uh, on the fantasy um, – with the fantasy pros, he said he would take him over like Kenny Galladay. I think that is a little too extreme for me. I'm incredibly risk averse when it comes to injuries and anything weird. Um, I think Gordon could be could be a value, but for anything, the only thing that I thought so far is, hey, I'm getting Julian Edelman at a discount now, maybe. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No. If everyone's like, that's what happens. People become one dimensional, and you're looking at Josh Gordon, Josh Gordon. And then Julian Edelman's ADP becomes a little bit more reasonable. Not that it isn't already, because you can get Julian Edelman at a pretty fair price. Yeah, if that gets cheaper, then, yeah, I'm excited about that. Over Kenny Galladay, I would actually think about that, because when I'm looking at Kenny Galladay right now, I'm like, well, I would rather just have Marvin Jones at a discount. That's kind of how I'm looking at it. And then in this uh, draft just now, I got Robbie Anderson, two picks later, Josh Gordon went off the board, and I was like, hmm. Maybe Josh Gordon over Robbie Anderson's point. I'm a big Robbie Anderson fan, but, I mean – Straight up, what would you, Robbie Anderson or Josh Gordon? Uh, I know it is, it's a weird comp for me. Oh, no, I mean, a weird spot because I like Robbie Anderson this year only because he saw what he could do with Sam Darnold in, in small bursts. Obviously, he disappeared in the middle of the season, but I am excited about that. Gordon, I could get. I actually, I, I could see him breaking out. I said I haven't really gotten a, really a chance because it came out of the blue that he was reinstated. He went in my league, and to be honest, I forgot 
about him, yeah. I would have actually taken him because right. I, I was actually trying to run the whole thing. So I like, I'm like making my picks. Oh, you're drafting too? I didn't realize. That. Yeah, I'm in League One. Oh, so like, if you ever see me going to the corner and staring at my phone, like, oh my god, what am I doing? Right. Yeah, I was drafting during the whole thing, but I like my team. But yeah, I would have taken Gordon. But yeah, that, that is, that, I think that's a good spot for him. Um, he definitely has a heck of a lot more upside. But I don't know. I, I again, risk averse. I like to take more safe, uh, more safe production. For sure. Yeah, and then safety, actually, you know, we're talking about safety. Robbie Anderson has played 16, 16, and 14 games in his er, his three-year career. So, I mean, that's pretty impressive and reliable form. Um, So, let's get into your sleepers, Matt. Let's start with the running back. All right, I don't know how deep you wanted me to go here because we're talking sleepers. Like, I'm talking guys like, you know, maybe you you may not necessarily even draft in a standard league, maybe a guy you're looking for in training camp, a guy you're looking for in the waiver wire that could be a difference maker. So, running back. Um... I don't know. I mean, Dexter Williams. I'm a Green Bay fan. I love Aaron Jones. He has not been able to stay on the field, period, whether it's by injury or by, um, or by suspension. His backup, quote-unquote, is Jamal Williams, who is really not very good at football. So, um, you know, they had Ryan – Pass blocking. Yeah, that, God, it's horrible. There was actually some – on another team, there was someone about how Irv Smith Jr., pass blocking, and now everyone who owns Rudolph is, like, throwing himself off a bridge. So, um, yeah, with Jamal Williams not really counting as a running back in my mind, and with the new, uh, you know, LaFleur in, I'm thinking he, he definitely wants to go use the running back, and if anything were to happen, Aaron Jones, Dexter Williams becomes just an immense value, and, um, you know, I mean, uh, he's, he, he, he definitely fits the mold as a three-down back, so he's a guy I'm looking for in training camp because – they had Ryan Grant for a little bit when the Packers signed him. I was always on Dexter. I, I backed off a little bit, but now Brian Grant was actually cut. Corey Grant? Corey Grant. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah Corey Grant. Well, Ryan Grant actually used to be on the Packers. Totally yeah, forgot. Right. Yeah, Corey Grant. So, I mean, Dexter doesn't have a whole lot in front of him. Um, so, yeah, I, I think for everyone thinking about, like, you know, handcuffs for other people, Dexter Williams is a guy that I think Green Bay is going to use the running back position enough where even if Aaron Jones isn't necessarily – injured or gone, Dexter could work his way in there and actually actually end up being useful. So so do you think it's a case of, like, talent will usurp anything uh, so that like, they'll have to put him on the field just because of his talent? Yes. Uh, the, the main thing here is, like, a da- you know, major thumbs down to Jamal Williams. I mean, I think Dexter Williams is the number two. Uh, I think that the whole pass blocking thing was a previous regime thing. Uh, they brought in other options to try to bring someone else into the mix. So. Uh, it basically comes down to Aaron Jones is, is a phenomenal talent. He literally hasn't been able to be proven even be on the field for even half a season almost. So uh, that, unlike, you know, even people like Dalvin Cook, Leonard Fournette, you're always looking for other options. That one is like someone where I think he'll legitimately have value at some point. Let's get into your wide receiver. Uh, who's your wide receiver sleeper? Same exact thing. I'm going incredibly deep here. Justin Watson, Tampa Bay. The, 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 uh, the numbers guys, you know, the Debbie guys, they love this dude. Um, but I like him for a very specific reason. I, everyone is really going over, you know, the three-headed monster, Evans, Godwin, O.J. Howard, how all three can possibly be supported. But um, Bruce Arians had been saying a lot that he loved Godwin maybe out of the slot, use him like Larry Fitzgerald like he did in Arizona. If that happens, Godwin or Godwin's at the slot, and all of a sudden Watson is opposite field Mike Evans, who's going to be seeing a lot of defensive attention. So um, this is a guy you take a flyer on in a deep league, but definitely keep – keep an eye out because if there's an injury or anything, um, he has all the talent in the world and a Bruce Arians offense that he could, he could take off, you know, being on the, you know, a deep threat. I definitely love him from a DFS standpoint is maybe a GPP option because he's going to be up and down like John Brown kind of uh, didn't mean for that to rhyme, but that was cool. But um, yeah, he's a, he's a guy I'm keeping an eye on a guy I picked up in like the last round of Scott Fishbowl. So another, just, I know these are, <laughs> Maybe in a standard league, neither of these guys are an option. But, uh, yeah, the, the guys that uh, if you're looking for a, a difference maker that you can get for free, those are a couple of guys. Yeah, these are definitely two deeper options that in 12-team leagues you might not want to consider just because of the draft board. Yes. I think Dexter Williams is a great flyer regardless. Justin Watson might, might not want to get him in 12-team leagues. But, no. I mean, it's a great point because, like you said, I mean, it's a high point offense. Look, he's going to be on the field. He's going to have opportunity if he's on the field. He's a guy who can go up and get those 50-50 balls. Uh, he's great with the back shoulder. Unfortunately, Winston isn't so good with that back shoulder throw. Yep. So we'll see how that goes. But I think Justin Watson is a great call. I mean, he's a great dynasty slash. He's a great, uh, you know, deeper league uh, steal, I think. You know, in like a 16-team league, I think you get Justin Watson to be comfortable with it. Another quick guy I want to mention. This is a guy you can actually consider in 12-team leagues, depending on how it goes in training camp. This is a guy like, you know, you, you always have someone you draft that maybe you can cut for waiver wire. 
DJ Chark. Um, you know, if Leonard Fournette goes down, when Leonard Fournette goes down, maybe they're not going to, you know, right call Armstead. Maybe they don't want to stick with the rookie and then they have Alfred Blue. Maybe they might want to pass a little more. And then I have Nick Foles. Obviously, Didi's the guy, and everyone's wondering who the wide receiver two is. I think it's going to be DJ Chark. Everyone's talking about Marquise Lee. Everyone's talking about, you know, even Chris Connolly could jump in there. Uh, Chark, you know, had the injury. He, he came back. He's a big body wide receiver, just like Alshon Jeffrey. And, and um, Nick Foles. And they used the second round pick one. Yeah, yeah. The draft capital's there. The talent's there. Nick Foles loved throwing Alshon Jeffrey. It's the same exact build. So I think that he's a guy that could literally jump right up there like a, and, and end up being like a, a tremendous – value um but it's it's circumstance based it's really just more of a pay attention a lot of people like to you know pay attention to like the damian williams carlos hyde darwin thompson stuff the training camp you need to be paying attention to stuff like this um and seeing if like you can get value at the end of your draft because that's where you know a difference maker can be i love dj shark and then if you play him in a certain week you're you can change your team name to shark week <laughs> and then and then, then you're having a great time with that no, i think dj shark is a great name uh, i think you know that this Jaguars offense, I think people are looking at it as a very, you know, uh, vanilla offense. I mean, look, it could be a lot better than we think as far as the passing game. Um, you know, we saw Nick Foles do work with the Eagles. Yes, that was you know a different situation. But look, there are talented receiving options that he has, including Leonard Fournette in the passing game. So I think that you know people really should consider this as like we're getting really good value on uh, Jaguars this year. Yeah, I. I... I did a 32 team series on my podcast on the daily blitz. And I was talking about the Jaguars and we went on and on about Leonard Fournette. And it just during the thing, I was wondering why everyone is so high on Dalvin cook. Like there's so many people that love Dalvin cook this year. And because he's a three down back, who's going to catch the ball and get goal line work, but he has injury risk, but people are just counting on him, them running the ball a lot. And they think he's worth the risk. If you're in on Dalvin cook, you should be in on Leonard Fournette. Who's a three down back who catches balls. Who's going to get goal line work and a team that's going to run the ball. Same thing with injury concerns, right? I mean, yeah, so. they're, I mean, they're kind of the same guy, except you're getting Fournette way later. So if you're in on Dalvin cook, you should really consider being in on Leonard Fournette. I love it. Matt Williams of FS statistics Clipcast as well. Uh, we just joined over at Clipcast. And we're very happy to. Um, so just tell everybody where they can find you on Twitter and just a little bit about Clipcast. So you can find me on Twitter at Matt Williams, M E T T W I seven, seven I M S. Uh, you can find me over FF Statistics and in Clipcast, uh, cl- uh, at Clip underscore Cast. It's basically like the Google YouTube for podcast. If uh, you, you want to know something about a, a player in fantasy football, like, you know, you want to know a little bit about DJ Chark, <laughs> they're, they're going to be talking about it. But if you want to know about Damian Williams, Todd Gurley, any of, you know, Andrew Luck's injury concerns, you can just type them into the search bar and it'll bring you up search results from all the relevant podcasts that happened recently. It'll bring you up like 20, 30 second clip talking just about what you want to hear. Uh, and that's it. Uh, we currently have a, we just brought out an app in the app store, Android or Apple. You can download it at Clipcast and we're constantly updating. It. It's free for everyone to use. Awesome. Yeah. You can find, if you just type in Tyler Boyd, we just did our uh, locks episode last week. Tyler Boyd was a lock wide receiver for me. You type in Tyler Boyd. You're going to find that uh, about eight minute clip. Just talking about Tyler Boyd. All right. I want to thank all my guests today, Matt Williams, Scott Connor, Ryan Weiss, and Josh Brinkner, thanks for coming on the show. Follow those guys on Twitter. Uh, follow me at FF Professor ST3. You can follow my co-host who wasn't here at the expo today, unfortunately, at Lake Sullivan FF. Go over to thefstn.com. Check out Draft Pros, um, and don't forget to check out my rankings on FantasyNation.com and also up at thefsgn.com. Uh, on behalf of all of my guests today, my name is Stephen Taroni. This has been the Hot Take Podcast.